Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1 and I'll be reading verses 5 through 13. And this is what it says. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, Christian love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble." For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. And I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder. Pray with me. Jesus, may your spirit stir among us that this day we never take for granted that you are here among us. And may we be changed by it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I read a story that took place during the Civil War. There was a, a young man that was tried for treason, sentenced to be hanged. Well, his mother began to appeal to Abraham Lincoln that he provide a presidential pardon where her son wouldn't be hanged. And Lincoln did give the pardon, but he is also noted as saying these words, still I wish we could teach him a lesson. I wish we could give him a little bit of hanging. <laughs> What's a little bit of hanging? Well, I think you know what a little bit of hanging is. It's enough to stir you up. It's enough that'll wake you up. It's enough that'll shake you up. It's a, it's a reminder to get back on the path, to get started again. Peter, he's writing to a church that's, well, it, it's been persecuted. It's discouraged. And He's trying to strengthen and encourage them. And what he says right here, he's trying to stir them up and remind them of the things that they already know. To give them a little bit of hanging. To, to, to put it out there to, that they'll get started again. That they'll get on the right path and get started back. And he's got this list of things that, that he tells them. And in verse 5, the very first thing that he says, apply diligence in your faith. Diligence, it's a, it's a practice. It's not a once in a while and occasional, occasional practice. It's a, a rehearsing, a practicing, a training, a going over in your faith. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. 
the diligence and faith. Faith, very often we think, we equate faith and belief as being the same thing and it's something that goes on in your, your heart or your head. But in the Bible, that word for faith and the word belief, they have the exact same root. And in Greek, the root is pistis. And it means literally to lean on or to rely on or to trust in. The faith is something you do. You just don't hold it in your heart or in your head. It's what you do. You lean on, you rely on, you trust in a person. In a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul was trying to get across the same thing when he's writing a letter to the church in Rome. And he's never been to this church before, but he's putting the basics down. The basics of the faith. And in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the, in it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That, that in Jesus Christ, here now among us, that in Jesus Christ, Revealed from faith in the leaning on Him, the relying on Him, the trusting in Him, the righteousness of God, the character of God, the holiness of God, the power of God, that it's, that it's revealed to you and me, but it's revealed from faith to faith. That it's revealed from that relationship with Jesus to faith. The relationship that we have with other people. Lou Holtz tells a story about a fellow that was driving out in the country. He was loving the, the, the drive. It was beautiful. His mind began to wander, and before he knew it, he was over in the ditch. Well, he tried hard to get out of the ditch, couldn't do it, so he walked to a farmhouse, asked the farmer if he could help him get his car out of the ditch. The farmer said, sure, I've got a mule named Daisy that can help you out. So they walked to his barn, and the man saw the most <laughs> worn-out looking mule he ever saw. And he said the farmer hooked reins up to Daisy and walked out to his car, hooked rope to the car and to the mule. <clears throat> and then he, he smacked the reins and said, Come on, Daisy. Come on, Jack. Come on, Joe. And all of a sudden, Daisy came to life and pulled the car right out of the ditch. Well, the man was incredibly appreciative, but he said, I, I had no idea that... That mule had that kind of strength, and it kind of looked worn out. I didn't think he could do it. But why did you keep saying, come on, Daisy, come on, Jack, come on, Joe? And the farmer kind of laughed and said, that old mule, if she thought she was the only one pulling, there's no way in the world she'd be able to do anything. Sometimes we think we're the only ones pulling. We think we're all alone. That if... If, if this period that we're in right now is, is marked with anything, I, th I think it's marked with a sense of isolation and loneliness and being separated from one another. The righteousness of God, the power of God is revealed from faith to faith. And the, the diligence of faith is what Peter says, the practicing of it, the rehearsing of it. The going over it, the leaning on, the relying on Jesus, but turning to, to the people around us. Faith is personal, but it was never intended to be private. It's what we use to hold up, to encourage, to strengthen those around us. Many of you received a, a, a brochure in the mail about our commons project. Commons Project is, is, is right here in the center of our, our campus, a redesign to draw the whole of the campus together in community and faith, in the coming together. That in the coming together of our small groups, our Sunday school classes, that they, they might lean on Jesus and lean on one another. And this is a space for exactly that, an outdoor space and an indoor space. But it's not only for those that are here each week, we have 40 support groups that meet here at this church. 40. Some are, are members of the church, but most 
are in the community. And they're beginning to grow. And the largest ones before COVID were, were, were pressing the space. We want to provide space for some folks that we don't know yet. But a common space to let them know that they matter to God and that they matter to us and that there's, there's, there's room for them to grow in community and faith. But this Commons Project, it's also there to reach out to folks we haven't even met yet. It's to provide a space of community and faith that leads, leans, and reaches into the future to folks to let them know that they matter to God well and that they matter to us as well. A place to practice community and faith. Diligence and faith is what Peter calls it. But you knew that. You knew that. You knew that already that faith, well, it requires a diligence, a practice, a rehearsing, a training of faith. I'm just here to remind you of what you already know. But it's not only a, a diligence in faith. The second thing in verse 5 that he says right here, and don't worry, I'm not going to read all of these to you. It says moral excellence. That after faith is supplied moral excellence. Well, why in the world would he say that? Well, Peter is dealing with a church that has had a heresy get into it. There's a, there's a lie that some people are beginning to practice, and this, this lie is that once you have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't make any difference how you act. It doesn't make any difference what you say. It doesn't make any difference what you do. That that's a relationship with Jesus Christ is all that counts, and, and really do whatever you want after that. Thomas Wheeler was the CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company. He tells a story on himself about a time he and his wife were going on vacation. They were driving on the highway. He pulled over to get some gas. The only thing available was this one dilapidated, one pump, one attendant gas station. And he got out and began to, to pump his own gas. And his wife said, would you like something to drink? He said, sure. So she went inside the gas station and and Thomas Wheeler could see her through the window that she was getting very animated, and so was the attendant there. And it was like they knew each other. She came back, gave him his, his, his drink, and once they got on the road, he said, you know, I noticed that when I was looking through the window, you were all animated, and so was the attendant, like you, you, you knew each other. She said, know each other. We knew each other very well. For two years, we dated in high school. We almost got married. And, well, Thomas Wheeler couldn't help but gloat a little bit. He said, well, aren't you glad that you married me, CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company, rather than if you were married to him, you'd be tied to a dilapidated one-pump, one-attendant gas station. <laughs> she said, make no mistake, my dear. If I'd married him, he would be the CEO of Massachusetts Mutual Life Insurance Company, and you'd be tied to a one-pump, one-attendant gas station. <laughs> well, I like the story. It's a great story. But the truth in it is that our relationships, they make a difference. They make a difference in what we do, in what we act, and what we say. Not only that relationship with Jesus, but that relationship with Jesus affects the people all around us. And the way we relate to, him, to them. But the relationship with Jesus Christ, it, it's the most transforming relationship you and I have. And it's required that it change the way that we speak, the way we act, and what we do. Peter calls it moral excellence. That the temptation is to fit in. To be like the rest of the culture. And right now, there's a lot that's going on in this culture that isn't very kind. That's divisive and polarizing. There's a lot in this culture that lacks integrity. You and I 
were called to something more. We were called to moral excellence. As the chosen of God, is the way the Bible puts it, we're called to be holy and beloved of God. Holy doesn't mean we're holier than thou. It just means a moral excellence. It says we don't act like everybody else. That there's a difference in the way that we speak. There's a difference in what we do. That we're transformed by that relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm not telling you something that you didn't already know. I just came to remind you, to stir you up by way of reminder of what you already know. We're called to a diligent faith, to moral excellence. And the last thing that, that, that Peter puts down here, now, like I said before, there's a long list, and the list goes through to your diligence in faith, Supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, Christian love. That's the very last thing, that, that he wraps a belt around all of those things with Christian love, with Christian love. Well, where did he get an idea like that? Well, he got it directly from Jesus himself on the last night of Jesus' earthly life. He called his disciples together. And he told them that the way folks will know that they're his disciples is by their love. And then he gives them a command in John chapter 15, verse 17. And this is the command. I command you, love one another. Paul. Paul who became a Christian later, who wasn't there that night, knew exactly what that was. And so in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, Bear one another's and fulfill the law of Christ. That it's not just, that the word that he's using there for burden is the word for a soldier's pack. And every soldier had their own pack, what they was necessary for their survival, what they needed for each day. And Paul's saying, your burden is not just your burden. It's your burden, and your neighbor's pack is also your burden. Bear one another's burdens. That we're not here for just ourselves and what's necessary for us. It's a love. It's a love in the everyday, in the ordinary, that reaches out beyond ourselves in what we say, in what we do, and in the way we act. Howard Kelly tells a story about when he was a boy in a small town. By any measure, he would have been considered poor. He said sometimes that there wasn't enough to eat at his house, and so he would find something, anything he could, and, and go door to door in a small town trying to sell it to get enough to eat. This particular day from the story, it was one of those days. He said he doesn't remember what it was. It was something that he found, maybe a magazine or a newspaper or something. And he was going door to door. He had missed breakfast. He had missed lunch. And the heat of the day was bearing down on him. He said he was beginning to get faint. And he was, told himself that in the next house, the, the next door that he knocked on, that he was going to ask for something to eat rather than trying to sell whatever it was he had. He said he knocked on the door, and the woman who answered the door was so pretty, he forgot what he was going to say. He got flustered, and he just blurted out, may I have a glass of water? <laughs> well, she saw that he was growing faint, so instead of bringing him a glass of water, she brought him four large cookies and a glass of milk. And Howard Kelly says that it was in that simple act of the four large cookies and the glass of milk that his faith in God was renewed in the simple act of kindness. Fast forward many years. The woman got very sick. The woman who had given him the, the four cookies and large glass of milk. And the doctor in that small town told her that it was beyond his ability to help her get well. But he knew a specialist in a distant city that could help her out. That specialist was Dr. Howard Kelly. Well, when she was referred to Dr. Kelly, 
and showed up there at the hospital, Dr. Kelly didn't recognize her name, did know the name of the doctor that referred her, but when he walked in the room, that's when he recognized her face. He didn't let on who he was. Instead, what he did was he worked hard to get her well. He saved her life. Nine day, he saved her life. And when she grew to healthy enough to leave the hospital, she was given the bill for her lengthy stay there at the hospital. And there on the bill was written these words. Your bill was paid in full a long time ago with four large cookies and a glass of milk. I was that young boy you showed kindness. Signed, Dr. Howard Kelly. It's the simple, the everyday acts of kindness, reaching out, not just what's necessary for us, but the lifting up, the encouraging, the carrying the burden of those around us. This morning it may be that you're in that place, isolated. You're in that place where you feel alone. Know that you are not alone. The risen Christ is with you. His name is Jesus. And he calls you into to relationship. But it's a relationship that doesn't end with just you and Jesus that reaches out. Reaches out to others in the, the simple, simple acts of kindness. The simple acts of, of Christian love. And the thing is that you and I, well, we don't have power for faith on our own. We don't even have the power for simple acts of love on our own. We don't have power to break through the loneliness or the isolation. But the good news this morning is that Jesus Christ does. And he's not left us alone. And I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, this day, we need the strength that you have. Yes, to be built up, to be encouraged. Strength enough to lean on, to rely on you. But a strength that that goes beyond ourselves and just what's good for us, that reaches out into a world that sometimes is not very lovable and not very lovely. Sometimes it's isolating and frustrating and lonely. But you give us power, the power we need. Breathe the power of your Spirit on us this morning. Then we may certainly... Certainly lean on you. Do what we already know. Live a life of diligent faith, moral excellence, and Christian love. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. 
He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.